If history is written by the victor, then where do we establish the truth amongst the ruins of our past? Is our history something we can simply take for granted amongst the glaring omissions of ruins and relics calling back to a history never written? Or perhaps a story never told amongst the campfires and chronicles? The relics call to a past long forgotten, or perhaps one even erased completely. Secrets of legends yet to be uncovered hiding plainly amongst the illusions and reticence of the people passing it by. It raises questions as to what really occurred and even whether this place and this reality is the same we were led to believe all along. This is the stark reality we are faced with in this unfamiliar Hyrule presented to us in both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, so let's engage that curiosity and investigate the clues, details and connections left to heighten our curiosity as we delve deeper down the rabbit hole. Today, we're out to find the untold stories and lore that's been hiding in plain sight within the Legend of Zelda. It's a pursuit anchored in the very nature of the legends come before, outside of the cinematic storytelling and cutscenes and beyond the surface level experience. We're going to engage in the interactive nature of the medium as it's intended, building a new understanding with insights, rewarding the time old craft of exploration, investigation and problem solving. This first installment is dedicated specifically to the mysteries surrounding the Sheikah and their origins, explored with a new lens rendered amidst the discoveries found within the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. It's the mystery of the Sheikah tribe and their origins, part of Zelda's hidden secrets and lore. And there's no better place to start than understanding why the mystery exists in the first place. It's going to be an interesting ride and I guarantee one worth unraveling as it promises to reward the curious with insights you couldn't possibly anticipate before this video comes to an end. The Sheikah are synonymous with mystery and intrigue built upon their scarce background and mystique. Acting to divinely steer the destiny of Hyrule from the shadows, their loyalty to Zelda and the royal family, in addition to the powerful relics such as the Lens of Truth and peculiar locales like the Bottom of the Well featuring in Ocarina of Time, only serve to raise more questions than they answer. The primary characterization of this shadowy and secretive tribe is the lady known simply as Impa. From her appearance in the first Legend of Zelda, acting to guide Link to his destiny in the fight against Ganon, through to the series' origin in Skyward Sword. Yet, times and histories seem to unravel amongst the eras and ages of legend, forming the inexplicable backdrop to the history of Hyrule we awaken to in Breath of the Wild. In this world where relics of the past seem long forgotten, the Sheikah have strangely and unexpectedly returned in force. Their numbers outweighing the legacy dating back to Hylia's War with Demise well before the Era of the Skies, and expanding their connection to the narrative in more interesting and nuanced ways than before. Yet despite their numbers and role within the ever-changing tides of Hyrule's rise and decline, the mystery of the Sheikah and their origins seems to have only intensified, and for us, there's no better manifestation of the curiosity this tribe have conjured than their unmistakable crest, that's the iconic Sheikah Eye. The symbolism of the eye varies depending on the source and is another example of Nintendo's clever application of design philosophy in generating idols and icons that are instantly and universally recognizable to people of various cultures and backgrounds, allowing them to interpret the meaning on a personal level without understanding the established lore or Zelda canon. For example, the Triforce itself has roots in a clan in Japan that dates back to the 14th century, but indeed the concept, that of the three key figures of virtue, relate to almost all spiritual and symbolic characterizations regardless of nationality or background. One example is that featured in Christianity, the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Another example would be that of the Triquetra, which we see in Norse history as well as that of the Irish, in fact. But back on topic with the eye symbol itself, influences can be drawn from a similar variety of sources that range from Buddhism to Hinduism, Taoism, and even today Masonic conspiracies that are printed on the US currency in terms of the all-seeing eye. Common themes surround the concept of a third eye and the similar placement being that on the forehead central between the brow and often considered symbolic of an enlightenment 
and spiritual connections to realms and chakra and that of energy flow and control. The likeness is one often affiliated with high levels of insight and knowledge, ranging from visions of clairvoyance to the detection of evil itself. So it's not surprising to see the inherent connections to the characterization of the Sheikah within Zelda lore, ubiquitous with the virtue of wisdom and seen as protectors of Hyrule's royal bloodline due to their alleged connections with the goddess Hyla in the era that follows creation and during the war with demise prior to Skyward Sword. It goes a long way to help to explain their dogged loyalty to the royal bloodline. It's based on their connection with Hylia's mortal incarnation Zelda. Although almost always part of the cycle that connects Link and Zelda in saving Hyrule, it's by and large been only Impa that we as players have seen to represent this famous tribe. We've all but disappeared in most versions of Hyrule, spare the lone Impa who remains loyally serving in whatever capacity she can muster. The bond between the two is played out beautifully in Skyward Sword, and Zelda's choice to become Sheik in Ocarina of Time only strengthens the deep bonds they share, in addition to the pursuit of wisdom and visions of truth in terms of future events. The lack of details have been the basis of speculation for decades now, and the mysterious symbol that is now synonymous with the clan has only served to heighten that curiosity. It's suggesting the Sheikah know more than we do as the invested player, a tantalizing source of rich lore and information always mysteriously hiding in the shadows, and scarce details shared regardless of their situation or source. The symbol itself started to appear in more and more places over time with associations to more events and people across other titles and the common sense of mystery, loyalty and knowledge was only further enhanced with notable examples. We have examples like the Gossip Stones which provide hints and knowledge to players in Ocarina of Time as well as the Howling Stones we see in Twilight Princess and then of course the Lens of Truth which appears in both Ocarina of Time and Wind Waker. The prevailing theory suggested this eye represents the knowledge of the Sheikah whilst the tear itself came directly from their heartache at the secrets they have to keep in order to perform the dark obligations in the name of the Kingdom of Hyrule. And this view was reinforced by Impa and Ocarina of Time, in the sense that the macabre setting we see in the Shadow Temple, and indeed that of the dungeons beneath the well of Kakariko Village, seem to stem from the same area that Impa had been implied to have built herself, that village of Kakariko. The setting is alluding to elements of imprisonment and torture of Hyrule's enemies. So the perception is substantiated and indeed the publication of Zelda Encyclopedia tends to reinforce this, stating the Sheikah live as shadows to the royal family and go to any lengths to achieve a goal. Knowing this, the eye on the crest sheds a single tear. But what if there's more to the symbol and the meaning with new insights based on learnings we can garner in the ancient past that features in Tears of the Kingdom? More than just generalized as shadowy assassins, the Sheikah's role within the series history is exposed to new details, and they suggest an origin that's connected deeply with the events that feature throughout the experience in this particular game. As we delve deeper into the mysteries of Hyrule, it's important to acknowledge the scope and nature of this journey. The Legend of Zelda tells the story of a universe that is vast and occasionally contradictory, spanning generations of storytellers and interpretations alike. This exploration in particular is an invitation to view the Sheikah and their lore throughout the history with a new lens, one that might challenge your existing perceptions and places you might not expect along the way, including the stories that they tell. Such was my experience in preparing what set out to be a simple theory and became something far deeper and meaningful along the way. The first revelation comes courtesy of the character bios and how the Sheikah are confirmed as Hylian. This might seem inconsequential or innocuous at first, however, they have by and large been considered distinct from Hylians in the past, and widely still considered to be the case amongst the various sources you'll find across the forums and wikis alike. The fact itself blurs preconceived ideas and perceptions of their heritage, and suggests a shared origin with that of the royal family and other Hylians. This discovery lures curious players to delve deeper into the lore, uncovering layers of history and symbolism they might not have expected in the first place. Another more obvious connection known to the Sheikah is directly related to the Zonai and the ancient past forming part of the narrative overall, and that's both physically and symbolically. The imagery of Rauru as Zonai preparing to unleash his light power showcases a third eye symbol similar to that of the Sheikah eye. This third eye typically closed but opening during the moment of power aligns with the Triforce's representation of power at its apex. 
The symbolism extends to characters like Queen Sonia and Zelda as well, who bear headpieces echoing this third eye, albeit closed, as a nod to their Zonai lineage. The parallel becomes even more striking, however, when we consider the character of Minoru, whose single tear mirrors the Shika Crest design almost to perfection. Indeed, her traits, a profound sense of knowledge and an intense dedication to her goals, resonate with those of Shika characters throughout the series. The similarity not only reinforces the symbolic connection, but also suggests a deeper shared lineage that may exist between the Sheikah and Zonai. Minoru's role in the game's events further exemplify the connection, highlighting a convergence of mystique, influence and dedication that characterise both tribes. Could the Sheikah's renowned mastery of technology, for example, trace its roots to the Zonai, particularly through Minoru's early innovations and machinations we see in the ancient past? The speculation aligns with the reoccurring Zelda trope suggesting a paradox where advanced Sheikah technology could have possibly been kickstarted by Zelda's introduction of the Puripad into the ancient past. This in turn could have acted to being a precursor to the very technology they later develop. Whilst I acknowledge these connections are speculative, they're no less intriguing. Consider also the Divine Beast piloted by champions from Hyrule's four races. They might not just be technological marvels, but actually spiritual successes to the sages referenced in the Imprisoning War. Perhaps the Sheikah in creating these mechanical giants sought to echo the ancient allegiances of the sages past, embedding within each beast the powers reminiscent of their legendary guardians. Their names indeed also resonate within the lore and the era of myth and legend, further suggesting a deep-rooted connection to Hyrule's past, a nostalgic reference for those who can remember the times in Ocarina of Time as well. Another reference can be noted in the personification of the founding monarch and we're referring here to Queen Sonia. Her headdress stylistically represents the similar third eye implicit with Rauru Minoru and is characteristic particularly of the Sheikah crest. On her shoulder, the white markings unveil another Sheikah type crest while a version of the royal crest can be noticed on her forearm. This suggests an alignment and amalgamation of the two important aspects within her character. She is suggested to be a priestess of sorts, but a more direct translation of the Japanese text in game relates to how it's specific to the goddess Hylia, meaning she's acting similar in a role to that of the Miko perhaps, referencing their Japanese history and elements of the past. One example could refer to that of Himiko, the shaman queen of Japan, debated still to this day amongst historians as to what role she played. Sonia is also a Slavic name derived from the Greek name Sophia, which in and of itself is referencing the word wisdom. As we uncover in the game, the bloodline and connection to Hyrule's founding is implied specifically in this connection that exists between Queen Sonia and Zelda, including revelations relating to Queen Sonia's discerning eye, said to reflect her godlike powers and foresight, specifically was significant to when it comes to King Rauru, but it's also noted in texts of that era. Another correlation is the practice of marking the Sheikah crest directly on the body or skin. The significance is explained by Pai in Breath of the Wild, who tells us more about the Sheikah crest in how those who bear the crest as a tattoo do so to honor the legacy and lineage within their past. This can be seen on the likes of Impa and indeed the Sheikah monks, where symbolism is directly discernible amongst the more devout members of the clan. The key traits of wisdom, foresight and overall strength of character embodied in this nurturing monarch referring to Queen Sonia explain how she stood proud and strong in both founding and protecting her kingdom. It's also reflected in the characterization of her kinship to Zelda. Whilst there is no implied evidence of the Sheikah in this particular era, the crest represented on Sonia and translated in her role as guardian of the land and her connection to Hylia only further add to the importance of the symbolic meaning of the crest in how it would permeate throughout Zelda's history. If the royal bloodline comes from Zelda's mortal incarnations, then it would be implied that Queen Sonia would have the same powers of the goddess unique to that lineage. And as with examples of Sheik and Zelda and Twilight Princess, the Sheikah connection is deeply personal and seems to be part of the very being of the royal bloodline. In essence, Tears of the Kingdom intertwines the fate of the Sheikah and those of the ancient Hylians such as Queen Sonia, as well as that of the Zonai, as all being part of key players founding the Kingdom of Hyrule and acting to serve as its guardians inherently linked to the prosperity of its future.
This resolve is more than emblematic in weaving a tapestry of shared symbols, traits, deeds, and historical impacts that will flow on throughout the chronicles of Hyrule's past and help to enrich the lore of the series as it moves towards the present day. Now, journeying through the history of the Sheikah, we uncover parallels with the Eye of Horus from ancient Egypt, which symbolizes protection against evil and the guardianship of the royal family. This resonates with the Sheikah law, as revealed by Pyre, the Sheikah crest is meant to ward off evil and honor the lineage. The Breath of the Wild tapestry narrates a dramatic shift, though. The Sheikah once revered guardians become feared outcasts due to a monarch's apprehension about their advanced technology. This fear fractures the Sheikah clan, giving rise to the Yiga, who, with an inverted crest, symbolize a stark rejection of their ancestral values, and tends to act to mirror Demise's defiance in his inverted Triforce, which features on his sword. This chapter in Sheikah history poses profound questions to us about loyalty and sacrifice themes that reverberate throughout the annals of Hyrule's past and shape the narrative of our exploration in-game. One pivotal question arises from Breath of the Wild though, which has really confounded myself and other players alike. Why did the steadfast Sheikah, traditionally unwavering in their loyalty, choose this moment to fracture? Their past as glimpsed in Ocarina of Time shows a tribe willing to sacrifice everything for the kingdom and its royal lineage, and it's understanding the motivation which is key to grasping the evolution of their role throughout the series. One point of distinction is the difference between a lone Sheikah being Impa as opposed to a larger tribe, and that's what we are experiencing in the modern version of Hyrule. Tracing our story back to that crucial moment in Hyrule's history, we witness the tragic fall of Queen Sonia at the hands of Ganon, who transforms the Time Stone into the malevolent Darkstone. It's an act of evil and the subsequent loss of Kingdom's beloved Hyrule left a profound impact on their very protectors. The heart-wrenching decisions made in this era, sacrifices including those of the King, the Regent in Minoru and Princess Zelda, likely instilled a deep sense of duty and gratitude to those who remained on. It was this small loyal band of ancient Hylians and sages surviving the aftermath of the imprisoning war who may have laid the foundations for what would become the Sheikah tribe. You see, in this in this instance they are united under a common cause, with the dedication to Hyrule's protection being paramount and a defining trait for those who remain. In this lens, the Sheikah would be considered to be those bearing the weight of Hyrule's troubled history, those who understood that their sacrifices merely forestalled a darker future. More so was a prophecy here, foretold by a princess who transcended time, warning of an inevitable resurgence of evil. This interim peace would be as fragile as the balance between night and day, hinged on the princess's chosen night and her power to awaken the sword that seals the darkness. In this world, secrecy was safety and shadows were sanctuaries, and the Sheikah eyes symbolized not just their past, but indeed their commitment to a future bound to the fate of the kingdom itself, the one they served to protect from darkness. This emblem they would tattoo on their bodies as representation of the wisdom that they shared and an unbreakable vow to protect the royal lineage at all costs. Yet within the Sheikah, a new faction would emerge, one that did not fully grasp the weight of their ancestral duty. Based on the banishment depicted on the tapestry, it's easy to appreciate their feelings of betrayal by a kingdom they had loyally served for so long. This splinter group formed the Yiga clan who rejected their unwavering loyalty, one passed down by their forebears incarnate. The schism is perhaps best symbolized by their absence of the Sheikah eye tattoo in general, instead choosing to wear their mark of the inverted crest on their mask which hide their face and true identity. They prefer to remain anonymous in their rebellion. In some ways, understanding the Sheikah's internal factions is the key to grasping the complexity of their history. There's an inherent dichotomy within the tribe which is marked by this schism, this division with the Yiga representing a militant faction, and lacking the direct connection and lineage of their counterparts which are embodied by the Sheikah monks on the other extreme. In place of violence and power which are sought by the Yiga, this faction represents peace and the epitome of enlightenment and dedication. Within the many shrines across Hyrule and Breath of the Wild, they wait patiently for the hero, offering their spirit orbs to Link as rewards for conquering challenges they set long ago. Their unwavering commitment to the goddess Hylia and Princess Zelda is evident in their meditative vigil, enduring through ages for the moment to fulfill their sacred pledge. Their eye symbol is tattooed prominently and signifies not just their faith, but also their understanding of the heavy burden that they bear. 
Within them is the knowledge of the kingdom's potential fall and the necessity of the shrines to train Link for the impending challenges he might face. They shed a tear also for the sacrifices still to come in the quest for peace. Their acceptance of this prophetic vision, a secret kept to ensure the unfolding of events, adds a poignant layer to the Sheikah's story. It's a revelation from Tears of the Kingdom that the Sheikah once considered a distinct race are indeed referring to the ancient Hylians dedicated to preserving the legacy of the kingdom's founders. This understanding redefines the Sheikah not just as a separate race, but as key players in Hyrule's history throughout. Charged with the continuation of a legacy pivotal to the reincarnation of the princess and the hero who once united the kingdom in its darkest hour and would serve to do the same in future events. In Tears of the Kingdom, the art of uncovering environmental clues and secrets is crucial to how someone might experience the narrative overall. Unlike traditional storytelling mediums like cinema, Zelda's story unfolds through player interaction. There's a freedom of choice that defines the richness of the narrative as one directly tied to the player's levels of engagement and imagination. They act as part of the choice in terms of the path of the hero and down to the very camera angles that define the lens of perspective. Tears of the Kingdom invites players to become active participants in that process. With the game's narrative not just presented, it's one that you discover and piece together through your exploration and interaction. And that's something that mirrors the Sheikah's quest to understand their own history as well, constantly seeming to research mysterious relics of the past, and it symbolizes this duality and mirroring which recurs thematically throughout the game. Indeed, the game provides us with a level of knowledge, but just like the Sheikah, our pursuit of wisdom is one that's sanctified through this search for intent and unveiling the purpose that's deep within the meaning behind the different relics and symbols that are left for us to uncover. Consider the side quest messages from an ancient era, which is part of the discoveries made relating to the stone tablets located across the various Sky Islands, each one inscribed with ancient Hylian text requiring translation, which comes courtesy in game of Wordsworth of Kakariko Village. These texts are the definition of the lore we uncover via interaction with quests and puzzles, and we're rewarded with insights specific to Hyrule's ancient past. It's worth noting the significance of their origins, which means they are protected above the sky barrier and are meant for the hero who would descend from the skies. And indeed, this can be interpreted as part of a grander design to impart knowledge at a critical juncture of time, specific to the fate of the kingdom. This quest offers a treasure trove of lore, and the significance of the meaning in reference to this investigation is in thanks part to the diligent efforts of the community. Specifically, I wanted to recognize the efforts of Reddit user Livy Bobby X, which has been instrumental in translating both the English and Japanese versions of the ancient Hylian inscriptions, adding layers of nuance and depth to our understanding, and as such you'll find references and links in the description of this video. The quest is goes beyond the main storyline and gives a narrative that we can directly attribute to the tablet's author, described as a chamberlain to Zelda when she returned to the time of the ancient past. They offer insights into key figures such as Queen Sonya and the role they would play in Hyrule's history, as well as events like the Imprisoning War and the Aftermath which is so very crucial to the fate of the kingdom and helps to identify what happens specifically in terms of the dedication of its unsung heroes and the choices they make. The Chamberlain's writings, infused with deep concern and commitment to Zelda and her kingdom, suggest a close bond with her subjects, especially those like Sonya, Rauru, and Minoru. The tablets not only supplement the in-game memories, but also provide a deep glimpse into the lives of those who bore the responsibility of guiding Hyrule through its darkest times. More than that, they aid how we establish the timeline and sequence of events. For example, the text delve further into details regarding Queen Sonya and her foresight or time powers. There's one quote where it references how there are many times when the wise Queen Sonya discovers everything with the discerning eye and brings him back. She's like a god of power who can foresee all of King Rauru's behavior. We also gain valuable insights into other aspects such as the Shrines of Light, which are determined to be built well before the events in the ancient past 
we see in game. The role of these shrines can't be understated. They present the many challenges we experience across the tiered layers of Hyrule that range from the skies to the depths. Crucially, they are also the source of light orbs that are gifted to Link in completing the challenges therein. The tablet describes how their origins are part of what's a pilgrimage of light, one that occurred with Queen Sonia and King Rauru in order to protect the kingdom from evil in the provision of these relics, and how they would act to exercise evil through a combination of their light and time abilities. Interviews with the developers translated courtesy of the ruling historian help to explain their purpose with the spiral of light being symbolic of the purification and directly correlating to the miasma being purged from Link's body when he gains the light power rewards provided by the statuesque depictions of the monarchs when he completes each trial within. As regaled in the ancient stone tablets and the same interviews referred before, the timeline means that they were built well before Zelda appeared in that era, leading us as the player to speculate whether Rauru and Sonya were aware of the role it would play in Hyrule's future. It seems laughable for them to build challenges and tests within each variation with no grand design or plans in their mind when they did so. It's another example of the mirror-like duality though, in terms of the symbolism themes we have in the Zelda games. You see, they were built with this dual purpose, I think anyway, of aiding the hero in similar ways that the monks had done, and the way that they prepared challenges in the ancient shrines to impart spirit orbs, reflecting the foresight of events to come and how that would aid the hero. It would make sense in both instances if they were constructions that reflected the foresight and prophecies of what was to come and how it would aid the future prosperity of the kingdom. The tablets explain the raising of the Sky Islands as well, and this is as a result of Minoru's technology specifically and plans enacted by her and Zelda. And this is a feat that's easily overlooked and really, I think, misunderstood in general. Being clear, this is referring to the Great Sky Island, and indeed, all of the raised land masses that comprise the upper layer of the map. The sheer magnificence would be a marvel that's hard to imagine, even in our times of technical wizardry. The Great Sky Island itself, where Link awakens, also houses key shrines of light, which reward Link with key powers and abilities, in addition to the means of mastering the Zonai technology, and include those things such as dispensers and power supply facilities that Link would need to get an edge in the journey ahead. Beyond that, we have to refer also to the other Sky Islands and Archipelago that exist in this cloud barrier and above. This also refers to more Zonai dispensers, but of more significance are two dungeons, we're referring here to the Wind Temple and Water Temple, as well as all the chests that contain rewards such as outfits referencing previous heroes, but also include the Sage's Will, reflecting the intention to arm Link with the support he would need of the Sages that include the ability to unlock their powers and strengthen their bonds. It's almost a direct reference of the prophetic relationship we see emphasised being the Desert Colossi and the other sage related depictions across Hyrule. We also need to note that the Sunder Lions, so very important in game, originate from this place as well. They're critical to fighting the gloom and aid the traversal of the depths in general. Another clue is the provision of a specific enemy encounter, that being the Flux Construct, again featuring the Enigmatic Eye, but also designed to teach Link how to use a multitude of battle techniques, gaining in complexity through each stage. They provide a unique and challenging encounter, one that allows for a variation of techniques that will no doubt encourage the hero to learn how to use the powers that he's being bequested with. But other islands exist with the same technology, and again, tend to reference Minoru's role in terms of raising them above the cloud barrier. And so this forms part of the same objective, a grand design of sorts, surrounding the future surety of the kingdom. We have the dungeons that relate to the temples inherent to the regional phenomena. We've got the legendary Stormwind Ark, which is a huge ancient warship gifted to the Rito from the Zonai. And then of course the great wellspring of Hyrule, the source of water supply to Zora's domain, floating above the cloud barrier and designed to be accessed only by the hero. It's also worth noting that the location of the Fire Temple, Lost Garondia, the ancient city of the Gorons, and the Spirit Temple, the vessel of Spirit's resting place and Minoru's construct factory, are both located in the depths itself, and they're locations that are only accessible 
in the event of a chasm opening up and giving way for Link to be able to make the traversal down to those locations. Something we didn't have in Breath of the Wild and suggests that there's almost a knowledge of the upheaval event prior to it occurring. Inherent again through these ancient tablets is the clue. This was designed for the return of the hero, specifically from the skies, indicating a grand design is purposeful and leads to more exploration and insight. Let's consider Minoru's dogged pursuit of building a golem and the implied purpose of ensuring her spirit would live on if her body was to fail. It's described in the ancient text as almost a borderline unhealthy obsession that impacted her very routines of eating and sleeping. This creation was something that was also tested by Zelda and we see the original design usurped in game by Ganon in her attempts to free the spirit temple from his very malevolence. Themes of prophecy also come into play. It's noted that Minoru specifically prophesizes Ganon's return in the future and Zelda is cited as foretelling the role of Link as the hero who would descend from the skies. What's intriguing about this revelation is understanding how Zelda's traversal to the ancient past occurs in the moment that Link reaches out to her, the defining moment of the catch. How does Zelda have any idea of Link's fate following that memory, that moment? You see, she has no direct knowledge he would even survive the fall. She was falling backwards at the time. Neither Zelda nor Minoru are privy to Link's whereabouts at all, and how could they possibly expect him to be anywhere, specifically the skies, and whisked away by Rauru for safeguarding? It implies an understanding of where Link is in the future, and it's a connection that we're unable to make as the players or audience in the game because we know that Zelda's blip occurred well before any knowledge of what would happen to Link and his destiny overall. It invites the player to consider a multitude of possibilities, not the least of which is the consideration of the meaning directly translating to that definition, the Hero of the Skies. Could it be referencing Link from Skyward Sword, perhaps? Another option could be the divining aspects hinted at that seem to exist amongst Minoru and Sonya and even Zelda, with these elements of prophetic visions and the nature of how it could be playing a role in understanding a possible set of outcomes that await in the future, parallel to Zelda's trip to the past. Unlikely, I'd suggest though. But the last possibility, the third one, is what I believe is the most likely outcome. It's based on the clues that are provided in the game that we can make connections with, and I'd argue it comes down to a more logical sequence of events and a process of elimination. You see, rather than speculating Link's return, specifically descending from the skies out of pure happenstance, it's actually implied to be a knowledge based on design and intention. We know Minoru's technology was the impetus for raising the Sky Islands and archipelagos, the temples and many relics that would aid Link's return. And around these islands, we see a Zonai-inspired design, one that enables their place amongst the clouds. The technology and almost pyramidal shape lends to the conical nature of other structures and a flow of direction that seems to mirror or marry to the taper inherent within the design. It's reminiscent of a similar object we've seen before and is at the heart of another mystery in the games, the structure that sits atop the sealed Demon King and places itself between him and the palace above. With Rauru placing the seal on Ganon and Minoru's body failing in the aftermath of the imprisoning war, Zelda's hope became lost up until she is beckoned by the spirit of fire to recall the master sword from Link awakening in the future. This is a moment that occurs in a location just outside the Temple of Time that ends up being raised as part of that great Sky Island. It's here where she gains the master sword and states that now she has this purpose, she knows what she must do, and that knowledge relates directly to her decision to undergo draconification and the plans to imbue the Master Sword with the golden light energy it required to be capable of defeating the Demon King in a rematch of their choosing. But such a plan is not a simple decision to make, and certainly not one you would think would be made without consideration, and it's here where the characteristics and traits of the key players really come into account both of them being very well versed with a strong set of knowledge, confidence, tending to always utilize research and organization in their plans and being quite particular about making sure things aren't left to chance. Zelda's transformation would be one thing, but ensuring the sword is entrusted to her new form, her path amongst the sacred light is short, and most importantly, the actual opportunity for Link to receive the iconic blade 
couldn't be something that would come down to pure luck or chance for these people. It would be part of a plan where the starting point would have to be the fateful collection of the sacred stone on Ganon's awakening in the moment that it was activated with Zelda and it gained her time powers allowing her to traverse to the past. Logically speaking, Link would need to be captured from falling himself and understanding she would need to repeat her original discovery, Zelda would have to be sure that she would gain that stone that would fall from Rauru's arm. It would only make sense that this spirit, the spirit of Rauru, which was sealing Ganon up to and including that very moment, could actually be the key to Link's rescue in terms of his fall and preventing catastrophe there. Lastly, they would need to come up with another aspect of the plan. They would need to be certain that everything required would be kept secret and safe in a place of their choosing, let's say above a cloud barrier amongst a sacred realm designed to ensure the many tears of those sacrificed for the kingdom would have meaning in its redemption through Link, Hyrule's last line of defense, as stipulated by Rauru. Put simply, these designs and plans would come into play in how they would build into the mechanism above Ganon's seal, the sequence enabling Zelda to assume the stone and subsequent powers of traversing to the past, as well as Rauru's spirit grasping Link from falling in the same moment, and finally, ascending Rauru's spirit and Link to the Sky Islands, where events would pick up as we see in game and we awaken to Rauru's voice. The pyramidal shape above Ganon's ceiling is being confirmed to contain Zonai and ancient Sheikah constellations, suggesting a programming of some description as to how it's connected to the spirit of Rauru maintaining that seal and the energy that's coming from it. The seal would combine the Demon King's malice with a purification of sorts, as we hear from the developers referencing Rauru's light. That would indeed create an energy that's captured by the ancient Hylians who would then be able to build the palace above it and contain that as a seal in the form of ancient energy capture and the same being used to power the heart of the technology of the Sheikah in general, including the formation of things like the columns that surround the palace, the towers and mechanisms that would be part of the automated defense in case of a future calamity. It's strange to consider, however, it starts to make a lot more sense the more you break it down. You see, that particular structure above Ganon didn't exist at the time of sealing, so it had to have been placed there by somebody and it only makes sense it would have to be Minoru and Zelda who would have put this particular plan into action. Creating a champion goes a long way to detailing where the ancient energy is actually located in Hyrule, specifically pointing out three locations, two of those being the ancient furnaces, and when we look at the structure, we can see how it appears to have been piped to that location. That leads us to question the third location, the primary source, and that is actually under the heart of the castle. Indeed, the same location that the palace would be built above the sealed Demon King, and where I believe this particular device was designed to not only capture the energy that would come from this fusion of Rauru's light power and the malevolence of the Demon King, but also contain within it some hard coding of how to actually sequence that event to ensure that the player would end up in the right place at the right time come the crucial moment of Ganon's awakening. Further supporting this is the function of the object as implied in the inscriptions which contain Zona and Highland writing. In the fact that it would also act to allow Rauru's spirit to be transferred with Link to the Sky Islands. We know that Minoru has been developing the method for spirit traversal or transference as part of her efforts with construct technology. And ultimately though, for her anyway, she would end up in the Pura Pad, which is an interesting fact. You see, this is partially due to her work being unable to be completed, but also suggests her affinity with the ancient energy that's primarily the source of the Sheikah technology being the Pura Pad or the Sheikah Slate from Breath of the Wild. The Pura Pad itself is derivative of the Sheikah Slate, and we're talking about here working with the same energy source, that being ancient energy, which only strengthens the implied connection Connections between the Sheikah and the decisions made following the showdown with the Demon King. You see, by design this mechanism would ensure safety above the sky barrier, away from harm, as Rauru's spirit remains in that area throughout the game. There's also a fair likelihood that there was a direct connection made between his spirit and the location of the Temple of Time. It would make sense as that location is also a trigger for Zelda's memory and the moment that we as Link unite with Zelda in a spiritual realm of sorts where the ability of recall is passed to us from Zelda directly. 
It's essentially also a key to teaching Link about the Shrines of Light to ensure he would have the required powers as well that would be passed to him in reference to the Zonai technology, crucial to being able to bend and manipulate reality, things like Fusion and Ascend, as well as Ultra Hand. Overall, the entire design is one that is synonymous with the acquisition of knowledge, absolutely crucial to Link's directive at that single moment in time in terms of what he would need to do which was find Zelda, and in that pursuit he would undoubtedly need to uncover the memories and tears of the kingdom and the events of the past so very crucial to its fate. He would be armed with the technology and tools to do so, and overall the design would be one reflecting the most opportunistic way to counter the Demon King in a new battleground of the future. As we piece together this hidden history, the Sheikah's role becomes more apparent. Absent from official chronicles, these loyal Hylians assume the role of protectors and secret keepers. Their actions hidden in the shadows align with the Sheikah's ethos of serving the royal family at any cost. And the quest implies that the Sheikah's origins are intertwined with these events, born from the necessity to carry on the legacy of Hyrule's founders. Historically, Impa and the Sheikah are depicted as attendants of Zelda, and the term of Chamberlain is almost synonymous with the term attendant. The final tablet inscribed should be read carefully as the details are quite significant. In the tablets prior, the Chamberlain goes out of her way to ensure that we're aware that she's doing this inscription willingly and that she had actually proactively asked Minoru for the technology to send these inscriptions skyward. It was a legacy of the kingdom and she describes it as her parting work or her final work. Indeed, the last tablet titled A Parting Resolve states how the Chamberlain knows that she cannot meet Zelda's love for her kingdom, but also that she needs to move forward to live a life worthy of answering the question of what else she could do to honour that love of her people. The Japanese translation is quite specific and implies to live and to thrive, but both and indeed the title tend to indicate or provide an allure of an oath or a pledge to carry forward the destiny of those who had ensured that things had come to pass, and indeed the suggestion of thriving points to plans of passing that legacy down to future generations. Symbolically, this would match the role of Impa and that of the Sheikah, who would be the active agents in Hyrule's destiny for countless titles come. And we see that reflected in aspects that always seem to be there to guide the hero and the princess, such as Impa's knowledge of the events of the past and make a vow to carry that love of the people forward and honor their sacrifices and hope for the future in the life that she would carry moving on. Perhaps this Chamberlain, along with the loyal Hylians who aided the sages in the continuation of the kingdom, would be the key to forming the Order of the Sheikah, as a tribe in the belief that they would be the defining legacy. It's worth noting that it's all but confirmed that there is a bloodline, one that connects Zelda to Queen Sonya and the lineage of the founding rulers. The Chamberlain also makes reference to the legacy those she has lost have left behind in the world as some being seen and some unseen, symbolically aligning to the defining traits of the Sheikah who work in the shadows, but could also hint at a secondary meaning, perhaps the progenitor of the royal bloodline who is implied to exist by the very definition of a connection between Sonya and Zelda. Potentially the role of the Chamberlain might have also been to undertake a protection role or caring role for that progenitor in terms of where they go moving forward. And that would give a different interpretation of the meaning of living and thriving in terms of the role of protector and guardian of that bloodline. I think it's fair to say though that regardless of the specifics of the meaning, there's definitely something that's quite symbolic and no doubt her final words contain that deep personal sense of commitment, something that's evident in the traits inherent within the Sheikah and the character of Impa. The other aspect is to consider that term, parting resolve. It lends a suggestion of the element of work done by the Sheikah over the time and history of Hyrule, such as the technology and knowledge that they would utilize in terms of safeguarding the 
the realm. Massive creations and mechanisms such as the Divine Beast. We have the creation of Sheikah Towers and Columns designed to activate in recognition of an impending calamity to safeguard the castle. The prosperity of the kingdom and the seal, as well as other key mysteries around the kingdom, suggest an active participation of agents working from the shadows to deliver the same grand design the Chamberlain is suggesting. The secrecy of the Demon King and his imprisonment under the palace and the Sanctuary of the Sky Islands as well are both considered crucial to the designs put in place to aid the hero in the days to come. The commitment is echoed not only by the Sheikah but also the Sages which we know watch Zelda's transformation into the Light Dragon. Consistent themes of statues and physical monuments ranging from the Desert Colossi to relics placed in Typhlo Ruins, the Lost Woods, the Farren Region, Temple of Time, as well as other places around Hyrule, all tend to echo a similar sentiment. It's honouring the Sage's role in the Imprisoning War, as well as the guardianship of Hyrule throughout time. In some ways, it's a method of recording history without overtly raising curiosity as to the actual Zonai origins and the technology or architecture that might betray the sanctuary floating above the cloud barrier, and indeed, the containment of evil lurking directly under the palace. The parting resolve encapsulates the Sheikah's vow to serve the kingdom to all ends, and to safeguard the kingdom's future, while bearing the weight of its hidden past. This dedication, shrouded in secrecy, is emblematic of the Sheikah's character and their enduring commitment to Hyrule overall. I must protect everyone! In understanding the gravity of the Sheikah's role, it's crucial to revisit a defining era in Hyrule's history marked by sacrifices that shaped the kingdom's destiny. This period follows the reign of gods and demons, and it's a time when the light of divine princesses had transcended the mortal realm. We learn in game of the actions taken by those loyal band of ancient Hylians and sages who remained behind, erecting the royal palace as part of the seal containing the dark secret buried beneath the Demon King's imprisonment. Such was the burden of responsibility to ensure the ongoing protection of the fledgling kingdom, and this hints at the importance of secrecy and mystique that plagues Hyrule's history due to the implications it has as to the fortunes of the many who would come over the years that would pass following the imprisoning war. This narrative is masterly revealed through environmental storytelling yet again, specifically in a stone sign found within the royal hidden passage. It reads, Deep beneath this land, our mighty first ruler imprisoned the demon king. To ensure the king's magic would hold, we erected a castle here to protect this sacred site. Without the castle in place, the site may be disturbed, allowing the demon king's hatred and rage to be revived. The preservation of this castle is therefore tied to the prosperity of the kingdom may it watch over an eternal peace. In unraveling Hyrule's past, we see the Sheikah's deep-rooted commitment to safeguarding the kingdom. This dedication is foreshadowed in Zelda's dialogue from Tears of the Kingdom, particularly when she reflects on the neglected state of the castle and the hidden tunnels beneath it in the introductory scene. Her discovery of the Zonai ruins beneath the castle and the murals depicting the imprisoning moor further underscore the Sheikah's role in Hyrule's history. The Sheikah's involvement in constructing the royal palace and the secondary temple of time, as well as their efforts in sealing the demon king, are vital pieces of Hyrule's narrative puzzle. Their work, along with the construction of Sheikah towers and the five pillars surrounding the palace as seen in Breath of the Wild, form a protective barrier around the kingdom's most formidable threat, and we can argue these kind of constructions would have occurred around the similar period of time. The strategic architecture designed to preserve this seal and prevent the awakening of Ganondorf reflect the Sheikah's unwavering dedication. Their actions shrouded in secrecy ensured the continuity of the royal lineage and the kingdom's prosperity as indicated in this stone. Law-wise, we can appreciate now other subtle and logic in the Sheikah's role throughout history. For example, the tradition of naming the royal daughter Zelda. It's more than a simple custom, it's a necessity designed for the kingdom's survival. In Hyrule's early days, Zelda was instrumental to the kingdom's founding, and that's what we see play out in the memories and tears of the kingdom. So it would only make sense that this tradition continues, ensuring that Zelda is always present to guide Hyrule through its most challenging times. The Sheikah, bound by a deep-seated loyalty forged from both the period of sacrifice and faith, are the silent guardians of this legacy, ensuring that the royal bloodline endures no matter the cost. 
Their burden is heavy though, their role often unseen and their commitment to Hyrule's past, present and future remain unwavering. Whether characterized by the role of Impa in previous titles or seen through extensions of the Sheikah in terms of the monks or other characters such as Pura and Robbie, the commitment of the Sheikah is nothing short of inspirational in the face of endless challenges and hurdles that would leave most wanting. Putting aside the argument of canonicity for a moment, it's worth noting how even Master Koga and the character of Suga are the embodiment of the rebellious division of the Sheikah in terms of how they veered away from following the rules of Hyrule's guardians, yet we see that revert back to the role of ally in another example being Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. Once the horror of the Demon King's influence became a reality impossible for them to deny, it was only natural for Koga and Suga to rejoin their Sheikah heritage in terms of the protectorship of Hyrule and indeed its people. Age of Calamity presents a parallel world exploring the outcome of a history divergent from the one we experienced in Brazil. Of the wild, and indeed, we are provided with an appreciation of how the Yiga ultimately understood the vow of the Sheikah when it became clear what a world under the rule of the Demon King would truly look like one where their loyal following was meaningless and simply a tool callously cast aside when its usefulness was served. Concepts like loyalty and meaning meant absolutely nothing to the one they had assumed would reward their efforts. And it's this extension of Hyrule where the Yiga are reminded of the reason the Sheikah had undergone the role of guardianship and protection of Hyrule and its people in the first place. For regardless of the whims of the various kings who may come and go through the passage of time, their influence would be minimal when compared to the scale of calamity and malice that was promised by the incarnation of evil, that being the demon king Ganondorf. A legacy is defined by what is left for those to follow, and the Forgotten Temple fits that criteria, as it's here we find more works of the ancient Hylians designed to help the prophecy of the return of the hero, in guiding him to uncover the tears and the memories bound to various locations and symbols mapped across Hyrule. This room should look familiar, as it's one in the same as the location where Queen Sonya is laid to rest following her murder by Ganondorf, and where Zelda's spirit is symbolically tied to the silent princess flower. Here we see the Sunderline, which adorns the resting place of Hyrule's founding queen, as emblematic of her light and nature that shone on the kingdom she loved. Carved into this room is a map outlining the location of the Tears as well as representations of the glyphs that they would be surrounded by, indicating the moment they represent and in what order they should be found. Inscribed above it all is a curio. It states in ancient Hylian, a tear with a tear. The initial takeout is how each geoglyph represents a tear from which the light dragon would shed. Each memory hidden within that would explain to Link the events of the past. But another understanding though could refer to the hidden translation of the hidden meaning of the teardrop. It's so iconic to the Sheikah eye symbol in how it would come to symbolize the resolve of the ancient Hylians in that moment. And indeed what we're discussing here today, the origins of that Sheikah tribe. The eye is representing the knowledge of the past and the future the three lashes, suggesting an alignment to the virtues and springs worshipped throughout the kingdom, elements of power, wisdom and courage, and indeed their balance. But the tear would represent so much more. It would encompass the loss and sacrifice of so many, as well as the tears shed by the dragon and the geoglyphs that the ancient Hylians would carve to help guide the hero of the future. Furthermore, it would act to provide evidence of the vow they would make, the parting resolve we discussed in terms of the Chamberlain's inscription earlier. The connection between the Sheikah and ancient Hylians becomes far more evident when we speak with Impa who reveals that indeed the geoglyphs carved were by the ancient Hylians of the past and how she has some information that relates to that, stating, you know I read something in the village's old literature, a passage about what the ancients called dragon's tears, where the tears rest upon the earth we mark down the images to which they gave birth. It's an interesting concept. Here we see Impa revealing that this information was found within some text in the village, that being the Sheikah village, and it's one that is written in ancient Hylian. Again, we can make that translation from ancient Hylian and information and wisdom passed down through the Sheikah specifically. It's also worth noting that the final tear dropped by Zelda as the Light Dragon is one that occurs where no geoglyph becomes present. It confirms that the geoglyphs themselves were a product of the ancient work. It makes sense, the tear occurs in the current day, meaning no geoglyph would need to be required as it wasn't present in the past. 
The Sheikah's architectural influence in Hyrule is evident not just in their defensive structures or what we've seen in the Forgotten Temple, but also their mysterious connection to the Zonai throughout. The colossal pillars surrounding the castle, as detailed in Creating a Champion, are designed as beacons to fortify Hyrule against the Calamity. These structures, along with the Towers and Guardians, form a vital part of Hyrule's defense mechanism, keeping the Demon King's malice contained and referring back to that level of protection inscribed in the stone tablet we find within the Royal Hidden Passage. Tears of the Kingdom delves deeper into the ancient links between Sheikah, or ancient highlands, and Zonai designs. The Zonai ruins in Tears of the Kingdom when compared to those of Breath of the Wild, reveal a layered architecture of sorts. We can find examples where an outer green layer gives way to the white Zonai-esque materials underneath, reminiscent of the original materials within the Temple of Time found above the Cloud Barrier, as well as the Shrines of Light that we find scattered throughout our adventure. Intriguingly, these layers are often capped where we would find Zonai inscriptions, suggesting a deliberate effort to intertwine Sheikah and Zonai elements and perhaps to obscure the true origins of Hyrule's founding, and the disguise of this is an implication of the Zonai's connection to Hyrule's founding and prosperity, largely due to the inherent design safeguarding the path of the hero. I'd argue this architectural fusion seems to reinforce the mystique of the Zonai and their role in Hyrule's past. The Royal Hidden Passage's inscription linking Hyrule's prosperity to the castle's preservation hints at a deeper truth the necessity to keep the past buried and dormant. The ambiguity surrounding the castle and its foundations serve to safeguard and help ensure the secrets lying beneath remain undiscovered, preventing the premature awakening of the Demon King. The Sheikah in their wisdom understood that the kingdom's prosperity was inextricably linked to the preservation of these secrets. Their architectural prowess was not just a means of physical defense, but also a strategic concealment of Hyrule's history. The threat of awakening the Demon King prematurely in a Hyrule unprepared and without its destined hero and the Reforged Master Sword tends to underscore the importance of the Sheikah's role. Their contributions, shrouded in mystery and steeped in secrecy, were critical to safeguarding not only Hyrule's present but also its past and future. In Tears of the Kingdom, the Typhlo Ruins and Sage Temple Ruins near the Regencia River offer profound insights into Hyrule's enigmatic past. The Sage Temple Ruins, once concealing the Twilight Mask we would find in Breath of the Wild, now reveal a Hylian-type architecture underneath, hiding as well with it a stone tablet with an intriguing clue. It directs us to unearth secrets hidden within a quest surrounding the monuments of Typhlo Ruins, north of the Great Forest of Hyrule. It's here that exploration of the ruins leads to a discovery in terms of the monument to loyalty. It's a testament to King Rauru and the Sage's efforts in imprisoning the Demon King, that moment we see in the memories of Tears of the Kingdom. It celebrates the loyalty of four Hyrulean warriors underscoring the collective efforts in sealing this great evil. The monument not only honours the sages, but also subtly nods to the Sheikah's potential involvement. The puzzle itself can only be unlocked once Link earns the powers of the four sages, that being wind, water, fire, and lightning, and that is only achieved through completing their respective dungeons, which we've defined earlier, are very specific to locations that include being above the sky cloud barrier, as well as accessible only by the hero who would return as a result of the design and grand plans put in place in the ancient past. The other feature of this is the reward, where players are gifted with another curio, that being the Dusk Claymore. The sword itself has historical significance in how it references Twilight Princess and the events regarded generally as the Divine Prank. The relic features in both recent titles, and what we notice here is that the definition has been altered in Tears of the Kingdom, and that sparks our curiosity. Originally described in Breath of the Wild as a creation of the Six Sages to seal a Demon King, Tears of the Kingdom presents a description which is more subdued, merely noting its ancient Hylian origins. This shift in definition or meaning might hint at the influence of time-traveling events, perhaps reshaping Hyrule's reality. Or it could be something deeper, signifying an undisclosed aspect of Hyrule's history. Kazul's remarks outside the ruins reinforce the connection, though, between the ancient Hylians, the Zonai, and the Sheikah. Kazul's excitement over this discovery relates specifically to how it is a confirmation of the construction being attributable to the ancient Hylians 
utilizing a design that is referential to the Zonai influence. If we couple this knowledge with how the titles show an amalgamation of Sheikah shrines and their involvement around Zonai ruins, or what we perceive to be Zonai ruins, we can understand how the blending of cultures and histories in Hyrule's architecture and lore suggest a deep interweaving of the Sheikah's legacy with the kingdom's very foundation and the Zonai influence that acted to be a precursor to that moment. These discoveries in Tears of the Kingdom provide a richer understanding of Hyrule's past, weaving together narratives of heroism, loyalty, and mystery in terms of the interplay of time. They suggest that the Sheikah known for their wisdom and cunning might have indeed been instrumental in not only the physical construction of these monuments, but also the preservation of the history they represent. The changing lore around the Dusk Claymore and the Sage's role in the battle against the Demon King highlight the Sheikah's influence over Hyrule's historical narrative, possibly guiding it to serve the greater good of the kingdom overall. We have recurring motifs as well in terms of the puzzles found within the Zonai ruins in Breath of the Wild, which also point to a deliberate amalgamation of other architectural styles as well. This fusion not only adds to the enigma of the Zonai, but suggests a deeper connection within the Sheikah's architectural heritage. The confounding presence of the barbarian garb is indeed one example, with its roots found in the Farren region helping to further blur the lines between the Zonai and Hylian influences of the past. But there's another example that's really prevalent when we consider it, and that's the example of the Zonai Swirl, an element of symbolism directly implied to represent the Zonai in Breath of the Wild, but also one that we can tie directly to the various Korok puzzles found scattered around Hyrule, particularly in the same game. You see, once thought to be exclusively Zonai, the Swell Tick symbolism elicits references to other memories and symbolism within Hyrule's past and indeed the history of Zelda. Examples would include that of the Kokiri in Hyrule's past and the significance of the Children of the Forest, which suggests a broader cultural influence in general, dating back to the Earth Spring even, embodied in the life and spirit of the Kokiri, the Koroks and the guardian spirit of the Great Deco Tree itself. Such is the regular amalgamation of Sheikah design and technology, indeed that of the shrines featuring prominently amongst the Zonai ruins, which tends to suggest an association of the Deku influence as well, adding to that intertwining of Hylian, Kokiri, Sheikah and Zonai symbology. It acts to invite the player to consider the historical significance of these monuments and the cultures inherent to their meaning. In the end, these discoveries and theories transcend mere in-game lore. They reflect the Zelda series unique ability to weave a rich tapestry of history and mystery and allow the players to explore and interpret the world brimming with secrets in their own right and perspective. The Sheikah, with their shadowy presence, stand at the heart of this narrative web, embodying the secrets enduring themes of timelessness, wisdom and the intricate dance between truth and legend. Indeed time, like a river, flows. Soon, the marks which define one thing from another wear smooth and new forms take their place, acting to reflect the cycles of nature as one where old becomes new and life translates to something far more connected than we typically appreciate in our world of labels, names and categories. The tales of our past are kind of like relics of Hyrule, where we need to dig beneath the surface to uncover the history laying beneath. It's almost like the work of an archaeologist to an extent, and indeed the exploration of Hyrule's lore can feel endless and overwhelming at times, but equally rewarding and fascinating for those who undergo the process. Each clue, no matter how small, can lead to a spiralling journey of theories and interpretations, making the experience deeply personal and engaging for those who go about finding it. It's here that we can explore how seamlessly the elements of the Zonai and the ancient Hylian influences translate to the Sheikah lineage as part of an amalgamated design, and indeed the plans across Hyrule and its past that suggest the mark of the Shadow Folk are diligently ones ensuring the kingdom's safety and maintenance through its secrets and crucial aspects in relation to how it might impact the future. One fascinating to me is based on a past theory and that's the connection between the construction of the East Reservoir Dam in Zora's Domain and how that related to the narrative of Breath of the Wild. It was one that confounded me and I thought would definitely come into play in Tears of the Kingdom. 
As it turns out, I got the answers I needed thanks to a combination of discoveries that include the Sage Temple Ruins, Typhlo Ruins, the Sky Islands, the Ancient Tablets and the Water Temple itself. You see, we learned how the Water Temple, the Great Wellspring of Hyrule, is directly correlating to the precipitous nature and abundance of water supply in Zora's Domain. The correlation to this structure no doubt implies significance in how we see the construction occur in relation to the Rotella Dam and the East Reservoir Lake, one that's explained as as a united works between the Zora and the King of Hyrule with their ancient technological prowess enabling this massive project. This detail was unearthed via the ancient stone monument questline in Breath of the Wild. It's here we learn the need for the dam relates specifically to the annual flooding which caused damage not only within Zora's domain itself but also downriver to surrounding areas which flow on to aspects of the palace itself and if we continue that direction we could also note that it relates specifically to the Regent River as well, which runs parallel to the ancient sage ruins. Indeed, the flooding hints to why these ruins occurred in the first place, and potentially a reason for moving the dust claymore. But also, we get to understand how such environmental threats could relate to the foundations and hidden chambers found deep beneath the palace itself. The flooding of Zora's domain directly threatened the very surrounds of the palace, and indeed the seal protecting Ganondorf. And so it would only be logical for the king and the Sheikah to aid the Zora in constructing the dam and the East Reservoir Lake to help ensure the prosperity of the kingdom remains intact via surety of the seal itself. It's interesting as well how this is uncovered through ancient stone monuments left around Zora's domain and how those ancient stone monuments relate to the tablets that we find above the Sky Islands inscribed from the Chamberlain as we referred to earlier. There's a mirrorness to the symbology and the mirror aspect comes into play throughout our investigation of the lore. Another overt example though would be the Sheikah Shrines and Puzzles which perform the dual role of aiding the hero in his resurrection from the initial throes of the Calamity, but also add to the mystique of the past by amalgamating their location with those typically considered Zonai-centric. It tends to suggest a shared legacy, although one shrouded in mystique, due to the lack of any records or knowledge to support the connections we're implying, including amongst the Sheikah tribe themselves. It's hard to argue, though, with examples like the Shrine of Resurrection. It's one that appears to have been intentionally built in a hidden, cavernous location on the Great Plateau amongst the second Temple of Time, seemingly foreshadowing the events that would play out in the aftermath of Ganon's awakening, allowing Link to recover from an initial attack and gain the crucial direction, support, and imbuing powers of the Protectors of Hyrule via the shrines and technology left for him. Consider this, Breath of the Wild begins with us awakening in the Shrine of Resurrection where we appear out of the dark shroud of that cavern to the Temple of Time which helps to provide us information about unlocking the shrines, the powers and how we can obtain spirit orbs to power Link up in his journey with the Sky Islands where once again we awaken with Link after a battle where he needs to recover and he has to find his way to the Temple of Time where he needs to unlock shrines which enable his powers that he'll need in his journey and we can go from there. Some say that this Hyrule is one where the past has been forgotten, but should we care to look harder, we uncover memories of the past seamlessly connected with our world as the legacy of our heritage is earned through exploring to gain knowledge that reward us with wisdom of the ancients. Some specific points worthy of note additional to those already raised would include the Dusk Bow, which can be found in the uppermost turret above the castle. It's a hidden treasure that contains information about the hero's past and relates directly to the Dusk Claymore we mentioned earlier. But beyond that, hidden treasure chests are found throughout Hyrule, with examples including those that feature the garb of heroes past, as well as other puzzles designed to raise our curiosity surrounding these past events, such as those I've explored in the past with the theories surrounding the Desert Colossi and the Seven Heroines, as well as other aspects we've talked about today. Indeed, the Yiga clan hideout actually comprises an ancient shrine of worship the Yiga have only recently usurped in taking their residence, and the similar layering of relics can be found there as well. But it contains more, hiding marking of Sheikah language cleverly disguised amongst the ruins to help support the notion of the Sheikah's involvement in times past in how these bonds extended into the construction of the buildings and relics important to those cultures and regions. We find examples of the sage's connection to the hero in the Lost 
vast woods as well, surrounding the resting place of the Master Sword and indicated by the stones that surround that very place. Indeed, the Farren region and the alleged Zonai ruins are another example, and even hidden in plain sight, with six smaller statues that surround the main Hylia statue in the Temple of Time found on the Great Plateau. Don't forget as well we have the springs that call back to Skyward Sword in their precise recreations and design, as well as the forgotten temple hidden in the canyons west of the palace. These locations are crucial to the traditions of worship and illustrate connections forged in the ancient past between the Hylians and the Zonai. The tear map behind the Hylia statue appears to hide specific Zonai-esque stylings, but crucially supports the role of ancient Hylians in providing the map and glyphs, with the knowledge subsequently passed down through the Sheikah specifically as we discovered. There's a paradoxical nature though to the Zelda series, one where timelines intertwine and characters like Zelda and Impa recur in various incarnations form. Each iteration of the series plays with time in unique ways, reflecting the adage of Dark Souls, with an apt consideration of the Zelda series in that time itself is convoluted in Hyrule. This is exemplified in Zelda assuming the role of Sheik in Ocarina of Time, and the dual existence of Zelda as both a princess and a mythical figure like the Light Dragon, possibly occurring within the same place and same reality with a different incarnation of her being. It's something we've seen happen before in the example of Skyward Sword, where Zelda is both sealed in the Amber Crystal helping to keep the imprison locked down whilst also being a figure moving her way throughout Hyrule's past and present with Impa, trying to unlock her very powers and help guide Link through his adventures as well. Indeed, this exploration of Hyrule's lore is a testament to the series' enduring appeal. It's one that invites players to delve into the depths of its history and speculate and theorize and become part of a wider community that collectively crafts the ever-evolving story of the legend itself, that being the Legend of Zelda. In this journey, the lines between reality and myth do blur, creating a world rich with possibilities where every theory and interpretation adds another layer to the legend. Hyrule's story is not just written by its creators, but also by its guardians and heroes, and indeed its explorers. People like us, the players themselves. In exploring these connections, I'd argue that the events leading up to Breath of the Wild and the subsequent calamity therein were necessary steps in the grand design of Hyrule's history. In fact, each failure, each triumph, each game contributes to the eventual restoration and renewal of Zelda and her kingdom that we experience at the end of Tears of the Kingdom. In this way, the narrative of the Zelda series is a masterclass in environmental storytelling, inviting players to piece together a history that is as common complex as it is hidden. In the end, The Legend of Zelda is more than just a series of games, it's a living, breathing world where the journey of discovery is as crucial as the story itself. Players are not merely passive observers, they are active participants in unraveling Hyrule's mysteries. Every location, every artifact, and every character play a part in this intricate dance of truth and legend, and the Sheikah, with their legacy shrouded in shadows, emerge as pivotal architects in this narrative itself. Subjective as any interpretation may be, the journey to understand these clues and hidden lore has left a deep mark on my own understanding and appreciation of the Sheikah. When I think back to that definition published in Zelda Encyclopedia we began with, whereas Ocarina helped to solidify their reputation, indeed Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom inherent through their connection and origins related to the Chamberlain's inscriptions, form more of a view in terms of the close-knit band of Hylians they actually were, charged with the kingdom's continuation following the heartbreaking sequence of events that comprised the imprisoning war, and indeed the sacrifices that would follow. It would help to serve and explain why such a bond existed in the first place, and further on, the implications and significance to Hyrule's past and future, as realised through Zelda's traversal to Hyrule's founding moments, as well as Link's actions in the modern era, only emphasise just how crucial the loyal solidarity of the Sheikah has been in the resolve of a pledge made in an age long forgotten. And that pledge was one to serve Hyrule and its people in a way befitting those founding members who sacrificed everything to protect the land from evil machinations and those particular of the demon. King. 
I came away from this investigation with a realization I hadn't envisioned when I began. One of the greatest stories in Zelda was right here. It was waiting for us to uncover through exploring the many connections and mysteries acting to implore us to question the world around us in this unfamiliar Hyrule. In exploring the mysteries surrounding the various aspects of intrigue, the common threads relating to the Sheikah became impossible to separate when viewed in light of the story of Tears of the Kingdom itself in what it was telling us throughout the experience. Experience. Some details were explicit and seen plainly, whilst other connections were less obvious. They were more unseen and required exploration and investigation to garner the insights the developers had laid into the game, reflecting their passion and love of the series, something we have in common. In some ways, the team responsible for creating these games could be viewed as Sheikah themselves, in how they have the insights and intimate knowledge of the Land of Hyrule, but also in how they act as guardians, protecting the realm and its future preparing safeguards and measures to counter the challenges it may face in the future and ensuring that it would endure over time. Their dedication and commitment comes from the resolve typified by the narrative of the Chamberlain, expressing that sense of weight and describing the sacrifices of those who had given so much and how that affected them personally in how they would move forward, a parting resolve. If you've ever lost someone dear to you, they remain a force of spirit and light within your heart and part of your very actions which can often translate to the role that you play in actively shaping the world of tomorrow in a way that honours them and their legacy. It's part of you. In that way, the sense of meaning and purpose, it marks what they made in their life as something important and gives new breath in what you do, remaining part of the world that moves forward. Their dreams and what they stood for, the things that had meaning to them remain true within those who carry forward their legacy as we resolve to honour their memory, and it's a pledge that means more than words, and it's expressed in ways that are both seen and unseen. Truth is found in that resolve, and no matter what someone else says or may perceive, the reality and significance is undeniable to the people who carry that with them and retain that sense of purpose and meaning. Indeed, for me anyway, the law within the game acts to mirror that sense of meaning, it's provided in a way that is dependent on your willingness to find it and whether the clues they provide spark your curiosity enough to dig deeper and then get you to explore the connections and iterations of the larger story by a process of interaction and piecing it all together overall. I think it manages to help strike the balance between those who are looking to find those types of stories and be invested in the fiction of the world that they would seek it out. They would then also feel rewarded in uncovering that sense of meaning and purpose behind these types of things but it also acts to respect others who may wish to move through the game more quickly or have a different experience entirely remembering this game now attracts players from different backgrounds with examples of speedrunners and indeed time poor enthusiasts as prime examples of players who would benefit from having such aspects of the world purely optional one criticism I'm hearing often these days is how Nintendo don't care, or how Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild are lacking with story. And with these clues and mysteries simply shoved in as distractions and no forethought or purpose overall. I guess, first and foremost, Nintendo in a similar vein to Hidetaki Miyazaki with the Souls series have been quite explicit in stating that their purpose is to leave room for players to engage their imagination in uncovering the wider story within their works. Both cases show evidence of multiple interviews with developers and directors reiterating the value in player engagement within the medium as part of the experience, and it's one that you can only achieve with that interactive nature of gaming. It's something they're passionate about and why they simply refuse to confirm one interpretation over another. Doing so is akin to taking control of the experience and making it passive, destroying the very effort put into the process of design and mechanics inherent in their works and indeed their labours of love. The other aspect is one that relies on that combination of interaction, engagement and imagination required to uncover those stories connected to the lore that we've discussed today. You see, in and of themselves they remain interesting tidbits of description. Lore is not story, lore is something placed in the game that helps add to the story. And so, in terms of that, they add flavour to the world, but they are nothing more without the effort and consideration of how they might connect or relate to various aspects that form the overall experience of the works therein. 
It's a bit like choosing to use the highway to get from point A to point B faster, but then complaining about how it lacked the beauty and character of the scenic routes you've foregone in the pursuit of speed and efficiency over character and enjoyment. In that journey, even if the radio tried to tell you about the beautiful scenery you were missing along the way as you sped down the highway just to keep you informed, hearing about it secondhand and without choosing to explore it yourself would feel out of place, almost hollow and dare it be said somewhat distracting. And so in that sense, I could appreciate having the lore and the associated enjoyment of uncovering this story as an optional aspect of game design as something that we should applaud instead of actually berating. It's helped ensure our beloved world of Zelda remains rich, but also retains universal appeal and popularity amongst the many who would buy it, ensuring it remains relevant and survives in the competitive landscape of modern gaming that has seen so many properties come and go in the last decade, let alone close to 40 years that Zelda's been a thing. Quoting now, I look back at that tablet where it says, when I make remembrance of their marks, I feel the flame of hope, though very small within me. It is though these marks describe some grand design. I can never meet Princess Zelda for her love of her land. What more then, I ask, can I do for Hyrule's people? Let my life lead me from henceforth fully worthy to answer this question. This chamberlain represents the beginnings of the Sheikah, or to some degree the embodiment of that virtue, as it would play out throughout the Zelda legends of the past to present day. And truly, this life was one worthy of recognition of the highest praise. It's an act of selfless loyalty and servitude from the shadows, by a people whose humility can only be matched by their fortitude in carrying forth the legacy of a kingdom for which it was founded. One marked by the pilgrimage of light in opposition to persistent darkness, embracing peoples of all backgrounds to the collective unity of a community defined by a life of peace where true power is wielded by those wise enough to choose to use it only in the service of a greater good and nothing more. Should we all be as mighty, may our loyalty never falter. For in this company, the true spirit of the kingdom and the lust born within its people should never fade from memory or legend. I hope you enjoyed today's video. It's the first for the new year. Hopefully worth the wait. It took me absolutely ages, rewrites and edits to express this mammoth effort in a format that I felt truly presented my passion for the series and its lore rooted firmly in uncovering the details and investigating connections as I've always done since my very first experience in The Legend of Zelda all the way back in the first title. I'm making an intentional move to head back towards the type of content that I think connects with like-minded fans of the series, where I can enjoy sharing what I love with those people who appreciate the same level of enthusiasm. That said, it might not be for everyone, and that's totally fine. Moving forward, I'll be looking to delve deeper into more aspects of that type of mystery and hidden lore and symbology, and finding meaning and light in terms of the discoveries we find throughout the games, and indeed this one, Tears of the Kingdom. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the video and the themes discussed, as well as where I'm heading with future content on the channel, particularly what strikes you most or allows you to connect with what I do here. 2024 is a year where I'm hoping to make some clear moves towards a more routine style, in addition to testing out new ideas in how I can actually get content out in a more fluid way. I'm good at talking, not great at editing, so podcast or episodic content I think will play to my strengths much more and I'd be interested to know if that's something you would also be interested in. It's a way of me being able to tell more story and explain more lore without being gated behind my slow editing capacities and abilities. If you like the video, then a like helps to score it, as well as a dislike if you didn't, so feel free to choose. But as always, be good to yourselves, and keep being amazing, because you truly are. And we'll see you next time, here on Gamesmiths.